I'd like to begin by stating the, the obvious, and that's we wouldn't accept this glass of dirty water. We wouldn't accept eating a sandwich made from, from that bread, which has gone moldy. So why would we accept breathing dirty air? And yet we do. And I think it's because there's a completely different understanding or misunderstanding of how poor air quality can affect our health, both in the acute and in the long term. And if we just go back to uh, the GBD burden of disease data from just a couple of years ago, this is the global burden of disease. You can see there the blue column. Uh, this is the loss of life expectancy, one year, eight months, due to air pollution, averaged out across the world. So we know in some places, of course, where air pollution is much worse, then that will be a much higher figure. In other areas where the, that is much less, then it'll be a lower figure. But air pollution comes forth on that list of uh, impacts on our health. Following closely is tobacco, all cancers and dietary risks. These are big, big challenges to, to population health. And air pollution is very high on that list. And that's really how serious you know, the issue is. And it's not just here in the UK, it's not just in London, it's right across the world. It's a worldwide problem. Now the nature of the air pollution, the source of the air pollution may vary uh, from region to region, from city to city, and therefore the solutions will vary as well. Uh, and that's why it's potentially such an interesting, interesting topic still for us. But of course, we, we had to start somewhere, and for, for me anyway, it, in my uh, career, it's been initially with the issues that we had around the fossil fuel coal, burning coal to generate electricity, the heater of homes, uh, and in some forms of transport. And that was a really major problem uh, for many cities in the UK back in the 50s. If you remember this famous photograph, the Great London Small here in Trafalgar Square, this led to many, many thousand deaths and it was actually today is the 1st of December, and it was this week coming up where we had the great smog in London and, and other cities in the UK. <clears throat> of course, this led to the 1956 Clean Air Act, and as a result of this really, really good policy, we had uh, the removal of coal from the inner city environments. It wasn't used for generating electricity. Stations were moved outside the cities and it was banned from use in, in homes. And as a consequence, these two pollutants, black smoke and sulfur dioxide fell dramatically over the next few decades. But as it seems to occur, when we solve one problem, there usually seems to be another one rearing its head behind us uh, due to some change in the way society has evolved. And you're all familiar with the the one that was emerging during the 80s, 70s, 80s and 90s, I guess. But I want to say that if we do bring in good policies, then we can really make a difference. And there's a, a picture of, of uh, what's now we call the Tate Modern. Uh, the air pollution has changed dramatically because of that Clean Air Act that came in. And that gives us hope, I think, for going, going forward. But the other problem that was coming rapidly behind it was the growth of the transport sector. And you can see here simply from 1950 to you know, five or six years ago, there was a, like a tenfold increase in the kilometers traveled by vehicles. Uh, this is UK data. And as a consequence, of course, a tenfold at least increase in emissions. So that was the new problem, the new air pollution source that we are dealing with, and it's really where my career started uh, and where I had to turn my attention. Uh, it wasn't to the, the, the coal smogs, it was to these traffic pollution events that we were experiencing more and more. So really this traffic pollution was a, a new challenge for our my generation, our generation, uh, as we saw increased congestion and emissions in, in many cities. 
So in urban areas, traffic is really the main source of modern air pollution, as I think about it. It's the tiny particles and nitrogen dioxide. And that was the one which really caught my attention and where I began to focus my, my research career. And I started that by initially being frustrated because I wanted to undertake human challenge studies looking at the effects of these air pollutants, but we didn't have the facilities in the UK. But in the end, I did make uh, contact and ended up with very good colleagues at the University of Umeå in Northern Sweden, where they had with foresight built an exposure facility. On the right hand side of this slide, you can see the, as it were, the, the factory side of the, the uh, facility. This is a big Volvo diesel engine with its exhaust being bled down, probably by about 90%, feeding through this wall, which is the same wall as the left hand picture here and into this exposure chamber where we had our volunteers that would come in <clears throat> twice, once to be exposed to this diluted diesel exhaust and on another occasion to be exposed to just clean air. And with this very powerful design where you're looking at the response of an individual to two different situations, you can eliminate a lot of the variability in human experiments, which is often a major challenge for interpretation. And so we went through a whole range of different studies looking at the effects of diesel exhaust, uh, petrol exhausts, uh, individual emissions such as nitrogen dioxide uh, or uh, particulates. And really it was a very fruitful time for research and we learned an awful lot uh, about what was going on in the lung of these individuals. And that was purely down to not my expertise, but the expertise of my colleagues, my clinical colleagues in Sweden, because they had perfected a technique called bronco avion and vage. And this is where you insert a fiber optic bronchoscope down into the airways of the individual, uh, the participant. Uh, and at the end of this bronchoscope, you can have a small camera, which will allow you to look at the airway, such as we're seeing here in the television screen. You can uh, have a little set of calipers, which allows you to take a small biopsy uh, of lung tissue, which you can bring back to a lab for examination. Or it allows you to introduce some saline into the, into the lung, which washes the surface of the lung, and you can pull that sample back, and again, take it back to the lab for analysis. And that's what we're showing you here in this particular uh, photograph. What we have is one of the cells which is present on the lung surface. This is a macrophage and it's there, it's an immune cell. It's there to protect you from any foreign material such as bacteria or viruses which enter your lung. But on this particular occasion, following a diesel exposure session, this macrophage has eaten up this material here, which is diesel soot. And in doing so, it is protecting the individual uh, from further interaction with this diesel suit. But for the trained microscopists that are out there, this is a not a very happy macrophage at all. And it's beginning to go through a series of events will lead to its death. And as a consequence then, it will no longer provide the protection which it, it did previously. And depending on where it does actually die and the way it dies, it may or may not release the material which is causing its death. So these clinical colleagues in Sweden were really, really good at helping us move forward the understanding of what happens in the lung when you're exposed to an emission such as these pixels. And as I said, over the next 20 years or so, we went through a whole series of projects and experiments which really took forward the field's understanding of why exposure to certainly traffic pollution can be such damaging, so damaging to, to health. But it was really, really uh, frustrating to me that what we were doing was having to go to another country to actually undertake an experiment to help us understand what happened to the many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that were walking along and shopping in Oxford Street 
which as you know, uh, at the time, those times was just full of red buses. It was like a red train or the old black car. And of course, all these were diesel vehicles. So it was around this time, uh, having these thoughts of frustration and getting on that plane to go to Northern Sweden on a regular basis to undertake the work, I suddenly had that light bulb moment that what we needed to do was not stick our volunteers into a chamber and look at what was going on, but actually was to actually take them up and down Oxford Street and to do the experiments uh, in, in that real world environment. So why don't we use Oxford Street as actually as our exposure chamber? And that one thought really took us into a whole new area of work in the core investigation. So this is uh, what I call the famous Oxford Street study. It was a study undertaken with asthmatic subjects. Uh, we walked them up and down Oxford Street for, uh, for a two hour period. And on another occasion, we walked them round, actually round the round pond in Hyde Park. And in each of the occasions, you'll see we've got one of our students here who's wearing a backpack. Uh, and in that intervening period between the sort of 90s and early 2000s, we had got access to equipment, monitoring equipment, which could be put in a backpack, which would allow us to understand what people were breathing in this outdoor environment. And so therefore, our volunteers would be walk, doing the walk and we would be measuring accurately what they were breathing during that period. And then we would bring them back to the hospital suite and in this particular <clears throat> study with asthmatics, uh, what we're looking at here is their lung function measured as forced expiratory volume in one second. So it's, it's a good measurement of your lungs, how it's working. The green data is when they were walking around Hyde Park. The red data is when they were walking up and down Oxford Street. And you can see the timeline here. So there's the two hour exposure when they're actually doing the walk, and then this is the time after the walk. So you can clearly see that their lung function fell more when they were being exposed to the diesel exhaust in Oxford Street than it did when they were walking in Hyde Park. And this small fall here is a totally normal physiological response of your lung to a bit of exercise. But what was really, uh, I suppose, new in this and, and not really thought through beforehand in this experiment was that when we got them back into the hospital suite the next morning to remeasure the lung function, those that had been in Oxford Street, we find had still got this significant decrease in lung function. So yes, it was an acute effect during the walk, but it actually lasted for at least another good 20 hours or so. So it was a, a pretty big effect on the individuals. And remember, these were asthmatic individuals who already had some form of compromised lung function. So this was a really, I think, important world, real world experiment, which started to help us understand what diesel exhaust from traffic emissions was doing to our lungs. And so we started to think about, from that day onwards, I think, we started to think about London as our laboratory. And we undertook a whole range of studies. I'll tell you about some of these in a minute. Uh, we used our super sites, such as this is Varlabon Road here, uh, when it was going through its expansion. Uh, we undertook a number of studies uh, on behalf of the GLA and the mayor. And of course, we used the London Air Quality Network as a basis for a lot of our work. So it was a really exciting time because this was a really big city with big air pollution problems but had, as you all know, had ambition to do something about that. But let's look at some of the, the studies which, which sort of evolved onwards. And the first one I want to talk about is the traffic project. And what I want to say here before I take you through some of the data is simply we had, the situation had moved on. It just wasn't uh, a few clinicians and a few toxicologists working together. To undertake these new studies, we really needed they were multidisciplinary. We needed a whole range of, of disciplines coming to the table to undertake the best research. And so we had toxicologists, we had epidemiologists, we had respiratory clinicians, cardiovascular 
uh, experts. We had data scientists. We had monitoring people. We had aerosol scientists. Uh, so there was a whole mixture of, of, of people who came together to really make this work successful using London as the laboratory. So the first study I want to talk about is around birth outcomes. And I'm just going to show you the papers and give you a headline for each of these studies. So this was published in 2017 in BMJ, and it was the impact of London's road traffic, both the air and noise pollution, on birth weight, a retrospective population-based cohort study. And basically what we found here was that air pollution from road traffic is adversely affecting uh, fetal growth. Uh, and this was, it wasn't the first time this had been seen in the world, but it certainly was a, a very powerful study in respect of the numbers of uh, patients and numbers of uh, pregnant ladies we were able to incorporate into the study. And it was a very sound result, I think, that came out of it. So there was something about what you breathe during pregnancy could actually impact on the growth of, of the baby that you were carrying. The second study was in slightly older children, there's these school children, uh, and we were looking at the impact of uh, air pollution, I guess, on, on children's health, but specifically on the growth of their lungs. And the study was focused out in East London. It was called the Exhale Study. And basically what we were looking at was the impact of their exposure on their lung growth. And the title of this paper, when it was published, was in the Lancet Public Health, was reduced lung volumes in children exposed to air pollution living in the London low emission zone. The low emission zone had just been brought in at this time, and we were looking for its potential benefit. But if you remember back to that time, the, the, the low emission zone itself and its, its impact was, was diluted because of various changes at the time. But basically what we found was within London, a smaller lung volume in children was associated with higher annual air pollution exposures. And this here graph, if you can see it, is the NO2 concentration at their home postcode. And you can see the vast majority of children, I think there were 350 or children in the study, the vast majority of them were living in, at homes where they just outside their front door, there was more than 40 microtels per cube of NO2 at the time. We also used this study to actually see if we could visualize the impact of that pollution on their lungs. So here you see one of the, uh, the, the child volunteers. What they're doing is they're giving us an exhale, exhale breath condensate sample. So we're irritating their airways a little bit with saline and they are coughing back up some of their, their lung mucus. And we can collect that in this sampler here and then we can examine it back in the lab. And guess what we find? When we looked at the macrophage population, we saw some of them look pretty healthy, such as this cell here. Others, we could see all these black dots inside them. And when this was analyzed, guess what? It was black suit, it was diesel suit. And we can see some of them, the macrophages here are beginning to show these big vacuoles. And this is a macrophage which will soon, very soon die and not be there to protect the child anymore. So exactly the same finding in this child who had walked to school along a busy route uh, that morning and had breathed in this diesel suit, uh, exactly the same result as we saw in those chamber studies uh, back in the Leo. Another study which we uh, undertook under the, the traffic project uh, was in the other end of the population, in the elderly. And here we asked the question, are noise and air pollution related to the incidence of dementia? And uh, this was a cohort study in London. Uh, and what basically we found was evidence of a positive association between residual levels of air pollution across London and the risk of dementia. So for example, if we split exposures of this cohort uh, to NO2 into quintiles, and we took we took the top quintile of exposure, then those individuals had a 40% increased risk of developing dementia than the lowest quintile of exposure. So again, very strong evidence to say there's something about traffic pollution and breathing that for you know a reasonable period of time in your life and it leading to 
a disease outcome such as dementia. So what I've done is I've taken you from before a child is born, while it's growing up, skipped lots in the middle, because we haven't got time, and taking you right to the other end of life. They show you that air pollution exposure and its impact on health goes right across the life course. And of course, this message came out very, very strongly in this publication from the Royal Colleges, Royal College of Physicians and Pediatrics and Child Health back in 2016. And it was called the health impacts of air pollution across the life course. And it illustrated very well that there were harms from high pollution, high pollution during pregnancy, in early childhood, uh, in, in later childhood, in adulthood, and of course, towards uh, the other end of life as well, with poor cognition and increased risk of dementia, etc. So in my lifetime, our understanding of air pollution has gone from, well, it affects the lung, you know, if you've got asthma, it's not very good for you, it may lead to the development of COPD, uh, to a situation where we think it's actually involved in every health problem that we experience as individuals across the life course. And, and actually, that's not surprising. If you think back to my very first two slides, I mean, what do we do to live? We eat and we breathe. And those two things, and we drink water, I suppose, those three things are really essential to life. And therefore, we need high quality food, high quality water, high quality air. So moving on, because clearly within all this story, particles are very, very important. And so one of the other questions which we asked ourselves during this research was, what is it uh, when we're assessing what's really important or the best metric to use when we're assessing the health impacts of particulate matter? I mean, all our standards, our legislation is based on mass, but is that the best metric? Uh, is size not more important? Because we know that the smaller particles probably go further and deeper into a lung and may cause more problems. Or is it just the type of particle which is really important? And in reality, you know, we probably, we think all of these are important. So therefore we need something that combines them together. So what we need is something which actually gives us a readout of particle toxicity. And that was another issue which we, we have worked on uh, over the last couple of decades. And our thoughts behind this, again, really started with our work uh, with colleagues in Sweden and thinking about what the lung surface was like when we were doing those bronchoscopy experiments. And here in, in this uh, electron micrograph, what I'm showing you is the surface of the lung. So here we have the air within an alveoli. Here we have the blood within a capillary. And dividing those is this very thin wall. You can see the, the metric here, that it, like, it's very, very thin indeed, because we need to get oxygen from here to here efficiently. We need to get CO2 from here to here efficiently. So the barrier has to be thin. But the barrier consists of this cell wall here, an endothelial cell, which is the capillary cell. A basement membrane, which it shares with this very thin cell here, the type one epithelium cell. And that's all we used to think that the lung wall consisted of, those three sort of compartments. But when techniques were developed to retain all the water components within the electron micrograph, then this fourth, well, uh, compartment was discovered. And this is a fluid compartment. Uh, it's the, called the epithelial lining fluid or the lung lining fluid. And it's very thin, but it sits on the outside of the lung, right from the tip of your nose, right down into the deepest alveoli. And it's a very interesting compartment uh, in respect of the chemicals or components it contains. But if you think about it then, Anything that you breathe in, such as particulates, the first thing they're going to see when they come in towards the lung surface is going to be this layer of fluid, the lung lining fluid. And when you analyze that lung lining fluid, which you can do by doing bronchial lavage, uh, you 
find that it uh, has a lot of proteins in it, soluble proteins. It's got surfactant lipids, which we know are very important. Uh, and it's got a number of other uh, protoglycans and glycoproteins. But I put up here at the top, ascorbate, glutathione, urid, alpha tocopherol. So ascorbate is vitamin C, alpha tocopherol is vitamin E, and urate and glutathione are two molecules which we make in our body. These two come obviously from our diet. Now these are low molecular weight antioxidants. And they're, we've known for a long time that these are good for our health because they protect us against damaging molecules which can come into our body, oxidizing ones. And here we have on the surface of the lung, a layer of fluid, which is jam packed full of these antioxidants, much more so than even in the blood just over here. So the, the body is actively putting them out there. Why, we asked ourselves in the early days. So any, any particles that come in have to first interact with the layer of fluid. So with that understanding, <coughs> we came up with a, an assay which would allow us to examine the toxicology of airborne particles from different sources or different locations. And we had a very simple working hypothesis. And what we said was, if particles are coming in to the lung, they first have to go through this lung lining fluid, which contains these antioxidants. And if they have these oxidizing components on their surface, then they will interact with these antioxidants. And these reactive components will become neutralized to a certain extent. So the particle which ends up hitting the lung surface will be different from its, ox in its oxidizing capability than the one that entered the lung in the first place. So that should be protective. But we know in some circumstances that it still will cause reactions because we see inflammation occurring following exposure to particles. So that was the pathways which we started to investigate. And so we took this lung lining fluid with its antioxidants present, and we took particles from different locations and we brought them together in an in vitro experiment. Now you all know we run the London Air Quality Network, which has got monitoring stations either at roads, busy roadsides or background locations. So that gives a really good contrast of different types of particles. So we simply went out and collected the filters, brought them back, extracted, extracted the PM, and undertook a simple experiment <clears throat> as shown here. So this is a micro teeter plate with its little wells. In some of those wells, uh, we, uh, we would have our lung lining, well, all the wells would have our lung lining fluid with its antioxidants at a certain concentration. But in some of the wells, we would not put any particles. They would be our particle-free control. In other wells, <clears throat> we would put particles from, say, a roadside site or a background site. Importantly, all the exposures, as we call them, were at the same particle concentration and the times were the same and the temperatures were all kept constant. So we were able to do a very direct comparison of particle type or oxidating activity of particle type against, uh, by measuring the loss of these antioxidants from the lung lining fluid over a four hour period. And when we did this, and I'm just going to show you this one uh, set of data, what we're looking at here is the loss of glutathione. This is a very powerful oxidant in our bodies. Starting concentration is 200 micromolar at the beginning of the, the, the four hour experiment. You, all these are different sites where we've collected particles from. MY1 is the famous model of Home Road. You can see that there's a difference in a color pattern here. These bluish sort of ones, we're seeing the most loss of glutathione, so they're most oxidizing particles. These greeny type ones, we're seeing loss, <coughs> less loss of the, of the antioxidants, so less oxidizing. And you will not be surprised to hear, if you haven't heard me tell you this before, that these sites are all roadside, these sites are all background. So there's something about these fresh particles at roadside which has higher oxidant activity than the more mixed up and diffused particles which are collected at background sites. So there's something by traffic emissions which makes the particles more oxidant, which would be more damaging in nature. So a couple of slides just to summarize all that. So we have our environmental pollutants. Uh, 
Here, I just talked to you about particles. We think that when we breathe them in, they cause oxidative stress to our bodies. And they do that by interacting with the epithelial lining fluid, the lung lining fluid, antioxidants. Uh, in some cases, that will overspill and we'll get a reaction by the lung cells and we'll get activation of the macrophages and the epithelial cells. We've got certain signals being produced, which bring in more inflammatory cells, such as those macrophages or neutrophils. They actually generate free radicals themselves. So we get the second wave of oxygen stress, all occurring because we've breathed in some particles which are not good for our health. So this is all contained within the lung. But as I said to you over the last two decades, our understanding, the effects of pollution have moved way beyond the lung. And therefore, we had to extend the diagram and we now know it goes out from the lung, goes into the vasculature, across endothelial cells, and affects cells and tissues elsewhere in the body, such as the heart. So that's the general idea that uh, we, the pollution is driving a challenge in our lung, which is based on oxidative stress, which leads to inflammation. And if this happens on a regular basis, then that eventually leads to tissue damage, and eventually we call that disease. Now, all of that came together in a number of publications, uh, there's mine back in 2003. And basically what it said was, what I just said to you, doesn't matter if it's PM with its chemical, oxygen chemicals on its surface, or nitrogen dioxide, which is a free radical in itself causes oxygen stress, or ozone, which is one of the powerful, most powerful oxygens we come in contact with. They all lead to this oxygen challenge to our body. And that's why they have this underlying health challenge. So <clears throat> moving gear now, thinking about what can we do about air pollution? Because that's been a big part of our work in the environmental research group, supporting the GLA and TFL over the years. So just reminding you, if we take nitrogen dioxide as a pollutant, if road transport is a major source of that pollutant and, and diesel vehicles contribute to big time, then of course, we're gonna need policies which address those emissions. And it's really nice if you've got some uh, antidotal experiments which help you show that this will really work. So here we have back from 2015, we had a bus strike. Uh, this is data from Oxford Street. And I think what we have here is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, bus strike on the Friday. You can see that the NO2 concentrations fell off dramatically. We still have some NO2 there because I think there were a few buses uh, going along, and they're certainly with the black cabs. But compared to the rest of the week, it's pretty convincing. You remove the diesel buses, taxis, you'll get rid of the NO2 pollution. So, so that was very clear. It was also very amusing when I think the following Sunday night, I happened to be sitting watching Top Gear, even though I'm not a car enthusiast, I do like the presenters and the, the, the stuff they cover. And what we had was our data taken straight off the website and we had Jeremy here saying that if you want to get rid of the buses, which is of course what he hates because they hold up his car, then here's the evidence. Not only does it, uh, not only is it good for congestion, it's also good for air pollution. So we had a strange supporter on that particular occasion. But I think the public has been really, really important in this journey. And uh, I use this as just one of the British Heart Foundation adverts. A small switch could help cut heart disease. So this is the anti-idling uh, campaign. So improving public awareness is really essential. And of course, there's been many, many uh, of, of the listeners today, I guess, have been involved in that side of things. But improving understanding by politicians is also crucial. That's very, very clear. And soon after Sadiq was, was first elected back in whenever it was 2015 or 16, I think our phones rang the following day and someone asked from his office, can we borrow one of those thingy jigs that measures air pollution? So here he is that afternoon in Oxford Street, holding an ethermometer which measures black carbon in between two buses. And he's basically his headline is saying, I appreciate that London's got an air pollution problem, it's having a big impact on Londoners' health, and I'm going to do something about it. 
And of course he did, he's been good to his word because you know, we all know about the EU lens and its recent expansion. We know about the electric bus program, the fantastic TX5 black cabs. I believe there's something like 7,000 of them on the road now, that's just great. Uh, encouragement for, for active transport, for cycling, electric uh, uh, bikes and scooters, etc. And you know, having more pedestrian ways, walkways in the city. All these things are coming out of TFL, GLA, which will moving forward will help us deal with the air pollution challenge we are. But as I said at the very beginning, there's always something you solve. One problem is always something else coming up behind you. And once we sell, you know, solve the tailpipe emission issue, we know we've still got the non-exhaust uh, PM coming from tires and brakes and, and road door. We've still got to solve that one. And that to me is, you know, less volumes of traffic on our roads, better public transport needed. I haven't had a chance to talk about the microplastic issue today, but many of you probably have heard the reports that there are microplastics in the air we breathe. They're smaller than 10 microns uh, in, in size. They will be going into our land. And of course, we've got uh, increasingly an appreciation of new challenges such as domestic wood burning. So these are coming up to bite us as we solve you know, the, the exhaust problems. Uh, and you know, future generations are going to have to deal with this. But you know, it's a, maybe even worse than that because you know, air pollution has got this inextricable link with climate change. Uh, increased temperatures will extend the droughts, high winds, change in vegetation. This is all going to lead to increased risk of natural events such as wildfires, which is having a real impact on air pollution in North America. Canada, uh, in Australia, many other places. And increasingly, we're seeing these desert storms you know, in, in, in the Middle East and in the Far East. Some of you probably saw the headlines coming out of Beijing, I think it was, uh, back around April, May time. They had a whole week where you basically, you had you know, 1952 London conditions. You couldn't see you know, beyond the arm in front of you because of the, the, the desert dust that was coming into the city. And then finally, we've got increased temperatures. Uh, they're going to lead to increased ozone concentrations. Uh, and I don't know if you remember this slide uh, here, but you know, we, we worry about traffic emissions of particles and NO2. If we get increased ozone, background ozone concentrations in our cities and, and, and rural areas, then this is one of the most powerful respiratory irritants we can come across. So this is not going to be good. Uh, so we need to deal with those, those precursors that, that lead to increased ozone generation. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, hopefully, you know, that you enjoyed uh, some of, not all of that, uh, learned maybe something as well. Uh, a lot of this was undertaken by my team, the Environmental Research Group. So I'm just, you know, standing here looking happy. Uh, it's really everybody else who, you know, has contributed more or less to the work that you've heard about today. And the final thing I want to say is you, you associated the ERG with, with King's College London for, for I think it was 27 years. During lockdown, we, we, did, we did the transfer. We moved from King's to Imperial to this fantastic new building, Mr. Michael Urine Hub, which is out of White City. Uh, and we've got fantastic new facilities there uh, to work in. And it really will take us through into this, I guess, the next decade of challenges. And when we can, we're going to welcome you all out for uh, an opening event, a launch event to, to our facilities in the Sir Michael Beer Hub. So with that, back to you, Christine, and uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think if we, if you stop sharing, terrific. Um, so we have some questions. I'm going to, that was, a very good uh, romp through time and pollutants uh, and the progress and the challenges. So we have some questions. I wonder if Peter Fleming could come off mute to ask your two questions. Your second one may have been asked. And then if Bernard Fisher stands by to come off mute. Are you ready, Peter? I am, I am. I didn't expect to be unmuted. Ah, there you go. <laughs> right. Frank, I know we've spoken about this before, but and you've talked about 
um, the oxidative stress on the body. Can you give us an idea of what else we're looking at as being, which other components of air, air pollution we're actually looking at as being the, the main causes of the health effects that we're seeing? Are we, I mean, you, know, you, you spoke there about um, a link to PM 2.5, which is a fairly broad measurement. Um, I know it's a lot to cover in a short time, but... Uh... I'll try. <laughs> so we've got all the different sources, we've got all the different pollutants, and they will be introducing different, let's say, chemicals into the body. So there's, there, that's a whole you know, lecture in itself, and you, you, everybody knows about those different issues. What I was trying to get across is that our understanding now is that it seems as if all those chemical, uh, be they solids, be they gases, they seem to challenge the body initially in the same way. And that is primarily through oxidative stress, because the gases are oxidants, like uh, that ozone, NO2. The particles contain uh, metals, transition metals, which lead to oxygen generation, or VOCs, which are metabolized and as a consequence lead to oxygen generation. So that seems to be the primary step which occurs at the lung surface. Uh, after that, that leads to the generation of signals which leads to inflammation to the lung tissue and eventually elsewhere, depending where those chemicals end up. And that, we, that seems to be the unifying approach. Now, of course, if you go back to the sources and, and to the individual pollutants, they will all do that to a differing extent and in a slightly different way. If you then bring in the, the individual's antioxidant protection, which is present in that layer of fluid and in their cells, then that will have an influence on how we deal with that challenge. And that inherent ability to deal with the challenge comes from both our genetics, because the glutathione and the urate is, depends on our genetic background. And it also comes from our diet. And that's why fresh fruit, good vegetables are good because they produce those you know, they provide those vitamins, vitamin C and vitamin E, which are really important for protecting us against the oxidants. So I don't know if that's answered your question, Peter, but yeah. it's it, it, it all comes together under that, that sort of umbrella in my mind these days. Just briefly, can I just ask, does that mean that if you got the data from an electrochemical sensor that was just measuring total oxidants, total redox potential of the air, that that would then be a useful parameter for investigating air quality? Yes, potentially yes. So we, we've, done, we've done the studies where we've, we've linked the, we've brought the filters back and we've measured the oxygen potential of the particles on the filters. We understand the oxygen potential of the NO2 or the ozone that was present in the air at that time. And we bring that all back into a health study and what we find was you see much better relationships between the oxidant potential that you put into that relationship and the health outcome than you do by putting in, for example, PM 2.5 mass. So that was a paper we published probably five years ago, Martin Williams led on. We now, as, as you're interested in, we, we've now worked with people in Cambridge and over in, in Basel, where they're trying to produce instruments which will measure uh, this OP online in real time. Thank you. Thanks very much. So if Bernard would like to come off mute and Roger Barrowcliffe stand by. Can you hear me now? Um, yes. yes. The question is basically, should we worry about susceptible individuals or should we worry more about the general the general population? Uh, obviously, we need to worry, about, well, we can't just pick out all susceptible individuals. That's the problem. We, 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 we know that certain 
We know that children tend to be more susceptible. We talk about the elder to be more susceptible. We talk about those with established disease to be more susceptible. But to tell you the truth, there is a range in each of those categories. And it may be, again, going back to their genetics, their diet, et cetera, et cetera, not just what they're exposed to. So I think what we need to aim for is, is to a certain extent, both. We need to have uh, policies which ensure that we bring down air pollution as much as possible uh, towards the health-based guidelines. But we also need to be cognizant that that may not even be good enough for everybody. And therefore, if we can establish that some people are more susceptible, then we need to give them extra support, extra help, uh, be that in, you know, just through education or medication use if they're asthmatic or, or, or just advanced warning of any air pollution events. So I haven't really come off the fence. I'm sorry, Bernard, but it's, I, th I think we're not at a point yet where we can give a simple yes, no answer. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Roger and Claire Holman to stand by. Hello, Frank. Welcome to the IAQM community. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, over the next decade or so, we're expecting to phase out the internal combustion engine from towns and cities um, with decarbonisation and policies around cars and vehicles, etc. Um, you might suppose that would lead to an absence of soot, as shown in your uh, macrophage um, pictures but we'll still retain um, tire wear from vehicles. So in that case, how would you expect the human body to react to this change in um, particle type that it, that it sees mostly? I, to be honest, Roger, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I expect it to react, but I don't know if it's gonna be worse or, or, or less, the reaction. Uh, we became very interested in this topic when a few years ago, I, I, I realized that the modern tire is, I think, more than 50% plastic. And linking that then to the fact that we can, uh, with, with new technology, we're able to measure these microplastics, many of which come from tires uh, in the air that we're breathing, uh, we're suddenly left with this big question, is this, is this bad for us? And if it's bad for us, how bad is it? I know we're just at the beginning of that journey. So that's what I was trying to get across, that you know, once we solve one problem, like the tailpipe emissions, there's probably another one coming up behind us to bite us. Now, maybe the plastic, the microplastic uh, uh, particles, which, you know, which are basically a new, a new challenge for our bodies, really, over the last, probably 20 to 30 years, and increasingly will be, uh, or will it be something else? Uh, so I, I, I can't give you an honest answer, but I'm worried that these are small enough to enter our lungs. I'm worried that we haven't been able to put our finger in exactly what type of particles out there at the moment are really the bad ones, and that therefore we just have a standard based on PM2.5 mass or PM10. So therefore, you know, I think the jury's out in this one. We, we certainly need to have, do more research and get a much better understanding of the potential problem that these uh, microplastics will, will have on us. And therefore, there, you know, there is a story there going forward about what the tire manufacturers have been doing, are doing, are planning to do going forward to try and probably offset some of this challenge. Thanks, Claire Holman, and could Blaise Kelly stand by if you feel your question hasn't been answered yet, Blaise? Thanks. So, hi, Frank. How are you? Very well, Claire. Good. Good. To hear you. Good. Um, my question actually has just been answered because my question was the composition of microplastics is very different to traffic PM. Do you have any evidence whether they are more or less toxic? And what you told me is no. <laughs> So I think that's simple, isn't it? <laughs> Move on to the next question. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd add one thing there, Claire. You know, as I said, another example is we, we now know about, you know, tyre composition and, you know, that 
that, that issue that we need to understand more. But one of the ways in which we're now recycling our plastic is actually to put it into road surfaces. Uh, I've seen lots of examples of this in Asia. I, I believe it's happened in North England uh, and maybe in Scotland as well already. And so we're taking these decisions about, you know, probably trying in the, in the, for the best reasons, trying to improve, you know, the, the planet uh, by dealing with this sort of recycling issue. But it may well be that we're, we're, we're putting plastic in a place where it shouldn't be in our road surfaces because they're eventually going to become irrelevant and we're going to get more ambient microplastic from that source as well. So I think it's a real live question. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Blaise Kelly, and you may be our last question. Over to you, Blaise. Uh, hi, Frank. Um, hi, yeah, thanks, for, thanks for that. And um, yeah, my question is also on a sort of similar topic um, and to kind of shorten it and get to the point a bit. Um, do you think uh, air quality professionals need to kind of get in earlier in transport policy decisions to address um, you know, what's, what's causing these non-exhaust emissions, which is essentially the weight of vehicles. So, for example, a bus um, emits far more non-exhaust, um, non, more, far more tyre um, particulates than a you know, tram um, or a bicycle does. Yeah, I mean, we are at this crucial point, I think, in in society and in city development, where you know, as, as people have already said, we're moving away from you know the, com the combustion engine. Uh, we've got big decisions where we're going to uh, spend our money in transport sector. I, I, for one, am a little bit surprised that we haven't gone more for trams in our city centres. Uh, they do seem to be very efficient, but it may be that I'm totally ignorant about some other component of that. But I think where you have a city that is planning its next 30, 40, 50 years of public transport, you need everybody that's got any knowledge just that relates to the issue around the table. And of course, you know, air quality, air pollution, pollution sources uh, from different transport uh, modes is very, very important. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, actually, on that one. Thanks. Thanks very much. And Peter Fleming's just put a comment in the chat. Uh, tires do contain carbon black, which in cheap tires can include high levels of combustion products. Okay, great. Well, there being no more questions, thank you very much indeed, Frank, for your time and for giving us that interesting talk. Um, and thank you to everyone who has attended and participated. And I look forward to seeing everyone at future IAQM events. Thanks very much. Bye.